Good afternoon. My name is Jen Beck, and on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to today's report launch. This past spring, I convened a working group of nine North Korea watchers who met over the past several months to produce a policy recommendation that we can suggest to the Biden administration as they continue to shape their policy priorities in North Korea. After months of discussing and debating and drafting, we came to the conclusion that public diplomacy should be considered an essential tool in achieving the US's long-term policy objectives in North Korea. Public diplomacy could help to fundamentally transform the domestic environment of North Korea, which could in turn create conditions that are conducive to the US advancing its long-term interests and policy goals of denuclearization and the promotion of human rights. Public diplomacy could also bolster other policy instruments designed to shape the regime's behavior, including traditional diplomacy, sanctions, and UN resolutions. Public diplomacy could significantly widen the bandwidth of pressure into an area the regime is most vulnerable to, which is internal pressure. In our report, we use the widely accepted conception of public diplomacy, which is activities intended to inform, understand, and influence foreign audiences. What we are proposing is not a tall ask. The people, the ideas, mechanisms, and theories of change to implement an effective public diplomacy policy all presently exist inside and outside of the US government. If the administration were to provide both resource support and the policy top cover that resource constrained public diplomacy efforts need to operate, the return on investment to the US national security interests and policy objectives in North Korea would be tremendous. Today, we'll hear from We'll hear opening remarks from Professor Graham Allison and Andrew Kim, and then we'll transition into a moderated panel discussion with some of the working group members who shaped and crafted this report together. And so first, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Graham Allison, who needs no introduction. He has been a mentor and advisor for a decade, and we are all looking forward to hearing from him. So Professor Allison, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jen, and thanks to the members of the working group for this effort. I think that uh, it's timely uh, with a transition of administrations here in the US. Uh, there's been a major uh, a strategic review as there is with the beginning of each administration. And looking back at uh, what's been accomplished and what's not been accomplished and what the alternatives are. And if the effort is to have some fresh ideas. I think your working group and the report offer some fresh ideas uh, since the other ideas that everyone else has had and pursued for over these years has had as limited success as they, as their policies, some many of which I've been involved with have, uh, even though the suggestions that you make in the report I think are different than normal and a little bit uh, radical. Uh, I think they only have to compete with other alternatives that have been tried. And as uh, uh, Andrew, one of Andrew Kim's successors, uh, Steve uh, Sawyer said about the strategic review in the Biden administration that has a, announced a new policy called calibrated practical approach. I'm not sure what the alternative was, uh, but in any case, he said, well, we've arranged the carrots uh, and sticks in different ways in different administrations, but we've all learned, the main thing we've all learned is that Kim Jong-un is not a rabbit. So we'll see whether uh, this effort can pull some rabbit out of a hat that others haven't. Just two minutes of, of context. 
for all of us, certainly on this call, who followed North Korea over the years, we can remember that this has been a challenge for the administration, uh, the U.S. administration, over three decades. I mean, the Yonbang started back in the Bush 41 administration in the 1980s. I remember in the Clinton administration when we declared success with the 96 agreement with North Korea and North Korea's denuclearization. So there's been a pursuit of denuclearization by North Korea by administrations now for more than three decades. And we can ask about this success or failure. And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, success in the sense that there's not been a nuclear war. There's not actually been a war on the peninsula. Uh, so that's good. But on the other hand, if our objective were no North Korean nuclear weapons, we've seen a steady progression of North Korea to first have enriched material and then have weapons and then have missiles. And so it's been on a path to becoming what it is today, a non-recognized but operational nuclear weapon state. So you would have to say that's failed. Now you and your working group have an idea that, well, why don't we um, try to change the minds of people in North Korea so that they would have a North Korea that would be more like a normal country. Uh, and then that North Korea would be more likely to eliminate its nuclear arsenal. Whether that's actually correct, we don't know. But as I say, this only has to compete with the alternatives and we've looked at their record. And I think it, while I tend to be from the, the strategic community that's fairly skeptical about such ideas, I also remember the old Cold War, which I'm an old Cold Warrior, and in the Soviet Union, ultimately the change in the minds of some people became the driving factor that changed the regime that ended the Cold War with a whimper rather than a bang. In, in the new denuclearization of, of uh, Russia, uh, but uh, indeed it almost uh, uh, led to, the, uh, to, to a nuclear uh, bazaar, uh, of which the Belfer Center and others, and I, Ash and I were involved in trying to deal with, but nonetheless uh, dealt with the adversarial relationship that had driven the Cold War. So the idea of working on the minds of people, including the broader population of leader that, of thought leaders, uh, and whether that's possible to do, it seemed rather implausible in the case of the Soviet Union. But people like Yakovlev, who or uh, uh, Shevardnadze, who were who worked very closely with Shevardnadze, and other thought leaders, end up basically changing their minds about the Soviet Union and end up changing Gorby's mind about the Soviet Union. So whether that's conceivable in this case, I don't know, but I commend uh, uh, Jian and the, and the team for trying to wrestle with a different idea. And I look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you, Professor Allison. I'd like to now introduce Mr. Andrew Kim who has retired from the CIA after 28 years of service. His last position was the Assistant Director of the CIA for the Korea Mission Center and is currently a fellow with the Korea Project at the Kennedy School. Mr. Kim, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jun. Uh, I really uh, appreciate your introductions and the uh, invitation to this uh, great event. Um, I read your reports and recommendation and I want to congratulate you and your panel members for outstanding work of all you have done on this very challenging and complex but very critical topics, which is North Korea, uh, public diplomacy with North Korea. I know that well because yeah, I personally involved in planning, coordinating and implementing several projects related to uh, this topic while I was in the government. I, I, in early 2000, I remember when US government was mainly debating 
whether North Korea's nuclear development should be considered as a WMD issue or leadership plans and intention issue. I thought at the time, we really need to know more about how public in North Korea feels about this um, issue. So therefore I spent about a year in Northwest China to get access to as many North Korean escapees as possible to, to get some you know, engagement with how they feel. Because as you know, US Intel community is, is a more equipped to to find out how you know the leadership's plans and intention in North Korea, they're more focused on that rather than how really the public in North Korea, how they feel about it, uh, certain things in going on in North Korea. So, so I took a whole year just to kind of get to a grassroots of this issue. Um, and uh, and and that's when I realized we as a US government had not done a good job in public di diplomacy with North Korea. Uh, based on what I learned from that uh, point uh, during my last year in the US government service, which was 2018, we established a plan that divided into a five target audience, uh, including North Korean, Chinese, South Korean, Japanese, and American public, and list four categories, uh, number one, what we want to audience to know and think. Number two, what message we will use. Number three, how we will reach, uh, reach them. And the last, uh, which US government entity will involve. So we went through those exercises at the time in 2018, because we took that public diplomacy is very important element. However, uh, our scorecard wasn't so good when executing those plan as we uh, faced several challenges dealing with the North Korea public. The first is the credibility issues with the US government. If audience does not trust, trust you, they will not believe what you say. So that's the very core issues that we faced. The second thing was, as you rightfully pointed out in your report that North Koreans are living in fear and desperate to put food on the table. Can they afford to take the risk to actively seek and hear an authorized voice from the outside? And why they know our message will not solve their immediate um, uh, need, are they really gonna try to, to be open-minded? Uh, for our message, right? So, so I give you a good example. Uh, there's one point. There was an effort to put uh, send in a radio into North Korea, tons of them, to make sure that the North Korean will have access to a radio that they can turn to channel. Because as you know, the, there's only one channel they can hear from their radio in North Korea. So we send in regular, you know, uh, let's say. Uh, the radio for the North Korean to have access to free Asia, you know, news and, and others. What we found out was that some of North Korean, when they get that uh, radio, having such a radio itself is a risk, right? So what they did was they opened the radio, took the battery out, toast the radio, and took that battery to black market and, and sell them for cash, right? So. So that kind of answers some of the face, you know, kind of issues that we face. Are they open, given that how risky for them to, to hear the voice from outside? And then is that hearing such voice and, and try to get to know the truth, is that gonna solve their immediate needs, right? So that's the kind of face, the issue that we faced. So, and I also had several moments and this is kind of very personal kind of uh, experience I had. I had a several moments wishing we had a robust public diplomacy uh, strategies that could enhance maintaining momentum of, of denuclearization negotiation with North Korea. What I meant is that, as you know, a government to government channel between North Korea and, and United States goes silent due to whatever reason 
uh, you know, you know, many, many times. During that moment, you know, I wish we have alternate non-government, non-governmental channel to maintain some sort of communication with North Korea. We were close to that, achieve that uh, in, in the last administration. Uh, we talked about, you know, US and North Korea, we talked about creating non-governmental channel to encourage cultural exchange, educational opportunity, and, and including uh, resuming ex exchange between New York Philharmonic and, and Pyongyang Philharmonic uh, you know, exchange, which uh, we had way back in 2008. Such a channel, if we established, will serve the purpose for public diplomacy and at the same time will help maintaining momentum of a government to government dialogue. And that's what I really thought sometime we were missing that we didn't have that. So once again, your recommendations are well, well thought out and will serve well for the current uh, US government. And I will really look forward to, uh, to your panel discussion and thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, June. Thank you, Mr. Kim and Professor Allison. I think some of the comments you made with regards to the need for risk mitigation measures and the need to decrease the costs um, and the risks for the North Korean information consumers are well taken and perhaps some of the speakers uh, today will address those. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn to Marcus Garlauskas, who has had, he's, he's also had an extensive career in the intelligence community and as a strategist. He's uh, notably uh, he's led the U.S. intelligence community's an uh, analysis on North Korea as the National Intelligence Officer for North Korea on the National Intelligence Council. So Marcus, this report emphasizes the importance of transforming the relationship between the North Korean regime and its people as a way to pursue long-term U.S. policy objectives in North Korea. So from your perspective, why do you think this transformation of this relationship is so critical. And especially for the, the people who've joined us today, whose primary interest in North Korea is denuclearization and security matters. How do we link this policy recommendation of public diplomacy with denuclearization in the long term? That's a mouthful, but over to you, Marcus. Hey, thanks a lot, Gianna. I'm really honored and, and quite happy to be part of this effort with some very distinguished colleagues. And, and what you've asked is really a great question. It's, it's a central one when we consider how to deal with North Korea. Uh, so before I answer, let me emphasize up front, of course, I'm, I'm now out of government and what I'm about to say reflects my personal views and not those of uh, any government uh, organization. So in the couple of decades uh, I've been involved in North Korea issues, I've seen a lot of stovepiping between the various uh, communities of experts that focus on different aspects of North Korea or touch on North Korea as part of some larger set of priorities that they, they examine. So I think that's been unhelpful uh, a number of times to understanding North Korea and, and to developing a cohesive strategy approach. And I think what you've hit on is one of the most problematic of these areas, this tendency to view uh, human rights promotion and denuclearization as separate or even mutually exclusive priorities. Uh, and I don't think this comes about by accident necessarily. I think North Korea has tried to encourage this sort of thinking. Uh, you hear their officials very publicly say things like, we won't consider discussion of denuclearization as long as the US is raising its human rights racket as a pretext for a hostile policy against our republic. Uh, and so th this, this sounds like propaganda and, and it is propaganda, but it, but it resonates. Uh, and there are some that actually buy into this sort of line of thinking. And you occasionally see commentary uh, from, from South Koreans and Americans, others that are really carrying North Korea's water on this. They, they claim that we need to hold back on human rights issues or pushing information into North Korea to have any chances of uh, negotiating denuclearization, because if we don't hold back, then that the, uh, the, the sense of a hostile policy that we have is gonna make it so the North Koreans will never give up their, their nuclear weapons. Um, it, but it's my analysis that the, the questions of uh, making progress on human rights uh, issues, uh, particularly the access to information and making progress on denuclearization, they're actually inseparable. Uh, and, and first of all, it's important to keep in mind that the nuclear weapons program, the missile programs in North Korea, they rely on systematic abuses of human rights uh, among a range of other crimes, uh, and including this, this control of information to enable this really, really poor country to be one of only a handful of countries in the world that has both nuclear weapons 
and intracontinental ballistic missiles. How else would it be possible without these human rights abuses, without this information control, to extract the resources and the labor uh, and the sacrifices from its people to be able to do this? Uh, does anybody really believe that North, a North Korean regime that had some accountability, that was responsive to the rule of law, that it could impose this kind of sacrifice on its people and not face massive popular opposition? Uh, so there was a saying, uh, uh, as the Pakistanis developed their nuclear uh, program, that they would be willing to eat grass uh, if that's what it took to have nuclear weapons. But this wasn't really ever put to the test. And I'll tell you, Pakistan today uh, looks like an economic paradise in comparison to North Korea when you when you really uh, look at the difference. And, and let's remember, in the 1990s, the, the eating grass wasn't just a, a metaphor. Uh, it wasn't uh, an exaggeration. North Koreans, uh, in some cases, were literally eating grass in an effort to try and survive. Uh, as Kim Jong-il uh, ran his country into the ground and continued to pursue nuclear missile program. Uh, so also the human rights situation comes into play in terms of how Pyongyang responds to the U.S. and the international community's approach uh, affecting the North Korean decision making on denuclearization. And so there's this old phrase that all the sticks are broken and all the carrots are poisoned, right? That's why we can't uh, change North Korea's behavior. And, and a lot of the reason that this is true comes back to the human rights situation. So. So first of all, the traditional lines of pressure that you apply to North Korea to denuclearize the international communities applied include economic sanctions, diplomatic isolation. Well, these sorts of things, they mean very little to a ruling regime that's got no accountability to its people and that ultimately does not have to prioritize their well-being or, or really, really care about what they think in order to stay in power. Um, if anything, there's good reason to believe that it's people being isolated from the outside world, is, uh, as uh, Andy was just talking about, actually helps to keep the Kim regime in control and to keep alternative narratives from gaining any sort of traction, right? So similarly, incentives, uh, the, the, the so-called carrots, particularly the economic ones that you see offered for denuclearization, they just don't resonate with the regime that would find uh, a vibrant economy that had free trade with the outside world. Um, they, it, would, it wouldn't really find it useful. As a matter of fact, they'd find it as more of a threat um, than a help to uh, the status of the regime and its ability to control. Now, uh, some officials in the previous administration, uh, you heard them like to talk about a bright future of economic development, foreign investment, trade, and prosperity for the North Korean people in exchange for denuclearization. Well, that might be a bright future for the people in North Korea, but I don't think it's a bright future for Kim's grip on power uh, in that case. So, so in a similar vein to uh, what Professor Allison mentioned, uh, my successor at the National Intelligence Council, uh, Sid Seiler, he recently said, you know, essentially, Kim Jong-un is not a rabbit, right? He's not interested in the, in the carrots we're offering. Um, so if we want carrots uh, to work to incentivize denuclearization, the ruler or the post-Kim ruling body of North Korea has to have at least a vested interest in getting carrots for its people. Uh, and there may be uh, many people um, that, uh, that are actually going to have an incentive um, to, to want to see the regime uh, denuclearize. But so as long as they are not really informed about what's going on, they have no real say, uh, and they're, they're at risk of being put in, uh, in a prison camp or executed, uh, you know, even alongside their, their family, punished along their, alongside their family, for even suggesting that these carrots would be better than nuclear weapons. As long as, as, long as those uh, systems are in place, uh, then what's going to incentivize the regime uh, to give up these weapons? Um, now, secondly, I also think there's a good case to be made that the Kim regime will always believe that it actually needs nuclear weapons for its security, as long as what keeps it in power is just its monopoly on violence and its domination of the information environment. Nuclear weapons can be the ultimate guarantee against outside intervention if you're facing domestic opposition and you intend to ruthlessly use force to suppress it. So say in some kind of extreme case, there's a rebellion going on in North Korea, uh, and Kim decides he has to use bombers, artillery, even chemical weapons uh, against populated areas, killing massive numbers of civilians to put it down. Now, in that sort of scenario, and we've seen things like this, right, in Libya, in Syria, and elsewhere, other countries in the international community would, would want to intervene. Uh, perhaps even the UN would, would want to mandate an intervention. Uh, but think about if North Korea has a credible threat of retaliating with nuclear weapons as that sort of intervention. You think any country is going to want to get involved to protect the North uh, Korean people if it could result in a nuclear war? Responsibility to protect takes on a different cast uh, when you're talking about a nuclear retaliation to that, that effort to, to intervene to help people. So at the end of the day, if you, if you really look at it holistically, uh, internal change in North Korea that changes the incentive structure uh, and therefore the priorities of the leaders in North Korea, that, that's what it's going to take to get to the nuclearization. And I, and I think whatever we can do to foster that change. Now, fostering it without pushing it to the point that we look like we're actively trying to overthrow the regime 
I think that's a necessary component of setting the conditions for denuclearization. We may not be able to directly change how North Korea's regime treats its people and their, their overall human rights uh, system. But we can at least, uh, in this example here, affect the North Korean uh, people's access to outside information. Uh, at a minimum, a North Korean population that's better informed is one that has to be taken into account by the leadership uh, in decision-making on denuclearization. And also, I think a well-informed people or a better informed people holds out the prospect for real gradual change, particularly after Kim Jong-un leaves the scene. It could shape what comes next uh, in terms of a leadership system. Eventually, uh, in this case, if North Korea is ruled by a leadership that has to take into account a better informed population that can't be uh, so tightly controlled just through oppressive security services and through sheer force. If North Korea's leadership has to be more responsive to the economic needs and the informational uh, interests of its people and is not uh, more afraid of meeting those needs um, than it is of, of uh, giving up its nuclear weapons, um, then, then if those conditions are met, then a negotiated nuclearization can be uh, realistic. Uh, conversely, uh, as long as that leadership is enabled by this information control and these human rights abuses and has those systemic incentives to prioritize having nuclear weapons over the prosperity and the health of its people, I just don't see how you can get to denuclearization other than through war. Uh, and I really don't think any of us uh, want that. Uh, so th this, I think, is, uh, is a realistic way over the long term to help move the ball forward on denuclearization, even though in the near term, many would argue um, it will in some way interfere uh, with efforts to negotiate. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. And so I think in terms of short term negotiations, uh, perhaps I think some of the um, speakers in a little bit will address those issues as well. So thank you again, Marcus. And now I want to turn to Greg Scarlett to you. Uh, Greg, you're the executive director for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea in Washington, DC. And you have a unique insight into these is issues, especially given that you were born and raised in communist Romania, and you grew up listening secretly to foreign media and content. I have a couple of questions for you in a short period of time. So first, I want to ask you, you know, could you give us an idea just what the human rights situation is in North Korea today? Jim, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by saying that it's been an honor and a privilege to be part of this uh, terrific group. Uh, this is an extraordinarily significant report. Um, colleagues in the faith-based humanitarian community have adopted approaches that target directly the people of North Korea, bypassing government agencies and so on and so forth, due to concerns pertaining about the lack of transparency, of course, monitoring send back of seeds, uh, share know-how directly with the people of North Korea in an attempt to improve their food security. This project pretty much goes along the same lines, proposing a public diplomacy strategy that reaches out directly to the people of North Korea. Why? And here comes the answer to the question. Uh, the human rights situation of the North Korean people continues to be dire. This is a regime that continues to run political prison camps, continues to uh, commit crimes against humanity. All resources are focused on those areas that matter the most in terms of preserving the power of the Kim family regime. Nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, weapons, keeping the elites happy for access to luxury goods imported from the outside world. When it comes to, for example, natural disasters, post-disaster recovery, all it takes is to look at pictures of such post-disaster recovery efforts going back to Typhoon Line Rock in 2016 or the most recent flooding in North Korea. You will see that all they have is labor. There are no tools, no trucks, no cranes even no shovels, you don't see that the most basic of, of tools. So the, the resources uh, assigned to uh, improving the human security of North Koreans are simply not there. North Koreans, of course, are in a perpetual and perennial human rights crisis. Let us not even mention the absolute lack of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, 
uh, freedom to elect uh, public officials and so on and so forth. But um, uh, the people of North Korea are currently under extraordinarily dire circumstances. First, there are the failed policies of the regime, a regime that has continued to refuse any semblance of reform or openness. Uh, over the past 30 years, we want to revisit the history of the Cold War. Uh, the, the regime initially addressed the COVID-19 crisis as a public health crisis. However, very quickly, the regime began using and abusing COVID-19 as a pretext to tighten political controls, to crack down on the informal markets, the people's markets, to crack down on border crossings, to crack down, most importantly, as you mentioned, Chin, on information entering North Korea from the outside world. So to bad policy, to uh, natural disasters, add these uh, draconian COVID restrictions, and you come up with a conclusion that uh, the people of North Korea are facing a humanitarian and human rights crisis, uh, perhaps on par with what they experienced in the 1990s. So on Ready that- the next question. Yep, on that very grim note, can you explain uh, why, why is it in the interest of the US and our allies to promote the human rights of people in North Korea? Uh, we fear a nuclear North Korea because this is a regime that commits crimes against humanity, against its own people and citizens of other countries, a regime in possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, if we look at precedent, this type of regime ends up being a threat to its own people, to its neighbors, to regional uh, and international peace and security. That's why it is so important to find ways to improve the human rights situation in North Korea. Now, of course, the Biden administration has made it clear that uh, shared values with our allies and uh, multilateralism are going to be two of the pillars of our foreign policy moving forward. Uh, on a personal level, and as executive director of HRNK, I surely look forward to uh, bringing back North Korean human rights onto the agenda of the UN Security Council, for example, and, and that should happen in December of this year. And this would be the result of a multilateral effort led by the United States as it was in uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017. We need to regain the higher ground that we once held. Uh, I was delighted to see that our South Korean friends, allies, and partners have joined us in efforts to address the, the, the very dire human rights situation in, in Burma, for example. I was delighted to see that our South Korean friends, allies, and partners joined us in, in co-sponsoring efforts addressing the dire human rights situation in Cuba. We need to get the alliance of the like-minded the United States, the European Union, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and others together again to raise concerns on the international stage, uh, raise concerns within UN fora. And again, once again, let me say it again, retake the higher ground that we once held. And lastly, uh, for you, Greg, Marcus touched on this briefly, but how could a policy of public diplomacy contribute to improving the human rights of people in North Korea? As you said, I used to be at the receiving end. We used to get our most trustworthy news from Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Deutsche Welle, from the BBC. Uh, it is very important to tell the people of North Korea the stories they need to hear. First, the corruption of their own leadership, first and foremost, the Kim family regime. Second, the story of their human rights situation. Of course, they can tell right from wrong. If you're oppressed, you know that you're being oppressed. And they need to understand that the Kim regime, the DPRK, is bound 
by its own constitution that includes wonderful uh, uh, clauses such as, you, you name it, freedom of speech and uh, freedom of religion, and also by international instruments that have been listed in the report and addressed. Uh, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Two Covenants, the Women's Convention, the Children's Convention, the Convention of the Rights of People uh, with Disabilities. They need to understand that they have rights and privileges and human rights that have been bestowed upon them pursuant to the DPRK's joining these international conventions and its own legislation, its own constitution. Finally, they need to understand the outside world. In particular, they need to understand the story of the other three, free, prosperous, independent, economic powerhouse uh, republic of Korea, South Korea. So in that regard, it is very important. Of course, information is one part of the story that they also need to understand how their system works, how it can be changed. They need to find the courage to seek change. And by that, I do not imply uh, bloody revolution, uh, loss of life. I simply mean transformation. The knowledge and the courage needed to consider transformation and positive change. Thank you, Greg. And for those who are interested in learning more, uh, HRNK, they have published over 50 reports, very detailed, very uh, research-based reports on various aspects of these uh, uh, dire matters. And so please feel free to check out those reports on the HRNK website. So thank you again, Greg. Sue, I want to turn to you. Many of you know uh, Dr. Sumi Terry. So you have had an extensive career as well in analyzing North Korea from within the United States intelligence community, including many years in the CIA. And you've also been an analyst and an academic for years, observing various uh, facets of North Korea. So from your perspective, why do you think that public diplomacy efforts are important for this Biden administration to consider? Over to you, Sue. Thanks, Jian. Um, engaging in public diplomacy efforts have always been important, but I, we really need to prioritize it as a policy for all the reasons that you and Marcus and Greg have just articulated. But let me just follow up with um, what, what Marcus and Greg talked about, just making three points. First, uh, I want to step back and talk a little bit about the North Korean threat in general to provide a little context for the topic that we're talking about today, public diplomacy information campaign and promoting human rights. The Biden administration, following months long review, um, um, announced its North Korea policy. Um, was it this April? In April, um, they called it diplomacy with stern deterrence. And frankly, I think this news barely registered uh, to the public because you know, to many, the questions of how to deal with North Korea never really resolved, but it never really fully escalated into um, a kind of existential threat. Uh, so, you know, perhaps this prevailing sense of, you know, our sense was that today uh, amid a pandemic and heightened the great power tension between US and China, there may be a sense that Washington basically has bigger fish to fry and more urgent crisis to focus on than North Korea. But I can't emphasize enough for the, for the audience um, that this impression I think is dangerously misguided, right? So years of inconsistent and at times counterproductive US efforts to contain North Korean, mostly nuclear threat, you know, because this is what people think about when they, when they think about North Korea. Um, but uh, our counterproductive policies have not have not only let this threat fester. Um, I think it led to where today, basically, the Biden administration faces far more um, capable adversary in Pyongyang than his predecessor did, right? Um, ever did in in the 15 years since North Korea's first ever nuclear test. The country now has a mass up to 60 nuclear warheads. It's churning out enough fissile material to build at least six additional bombs per year. North Korea is not like, likely moving to towards next step, placing multiple warheads on a single missile, and so on. And an emboldened North, emboldened nuclear North Korea is likely to pursue a more coercive policy. This is why a more disruptive provocations would would uh, it would increase you know, including cyber attacks and proliferation behavior. 
But, and this is an important point that our report is trying to make, North Korea's multidimensional threat does not end with just the nuclear missile programs. It includes human rights abuses as Marcus and Greg just so eloquently just articulated. Um, this is an important pain, uh, point this paper makes um, that North Korea's nuclear system that we're all focused on um, and the Kim regime's human rights abuses of its own people are, Marcus have said, and I, I think Greg and Jill, you have said, they're just inseparable. And this, I think we, we make this point in, in the report. North Korea would not have uh, been able to get to where they are with this nuclear arsenal that I just laid out with missile program and so on, if the regime did not um, also, as Marcus pointed out, just persistently and consistently deprive North Korean people of resources and engage in human rights violations. So the Kim family have spent billions of dollars, we know, on the nuclear missile program while failing to provide for the, the North Korean people. Um, so that's a North Korean threat. The second point is on US policy towards North Korea. Washington has basically exhausted um, over the years its peaceful options to no avail, uh, as we know, spending now three decades, uh, beginning with the Clintons and Clint, President Clinton, two-term Bush and Obama and President Trump, and now the Biden, President Biden, and perhaps, you know, Perhaps the only policy that might have achieved denuclearization, maybe I still think it's unlikely, uh, like attacking North Korea or toppling the regime by force. That is an option that is fraught with uncertainty. And we would all agree, and Marcus brought this, uh, pointed this out too, that pursuing this path would have exacted an unacceptable human toll. So, so, so let's just review the, North, uh, the US options, right? Um, I just mentioned that come what may, Dealing with North Korean, in dealing with North Korean threat, we would agree that a preemptive strike or kinetic option with the North need, needs to remain off limits. Um, the one real time that we considered that the United States, besides the bloody nose thing in 2017, the one time that Washington seriously considered a kinetic option against North Korea was in 1994. Uh, but if it was deemed too risky and costly to pursue it then, it's all the more so today. So that's out. Then what about the further dialogue and negotiations? You know, pursuing dialogue and negotiation with North Korea is certainly a better option than pursuing a kinetic option, but let's also face it. It's not any more likely to bring about denuclearization or bring about human rights improvements or you know, any kind of improvements for the lives of the Korean, North Korean people. So at most, North Korea will agree to perhaps an interim uh, kind of freeze deal that might possibly put some limit on nuclear facilities for a given period. But history suggests that negotiations will likely fail over the issue of verification as it has over and over. The Biden administration thus has come with, come to terms with two fundamental facts. Um, first, North Korea will not give up nuclear weapons or improve the rights of their people as long as this regime as it currently is without behavioral change remains in charge. Um, so what do we do? Um, you know, okay, give, give diplomacy another round of, you know, a try, right? I, I'm not against that. We're not against that. Uh, the U.S. needs not, um, and then why we're doing that, we, you know, we, we need to contain the threat, right? We need to, um, but what we're saying, I think, is, is we need to help change the situation in the North from bottom up. This means, this means while probing uh, to see if the Kim regime is interested in dialogue, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, uh, we're not saying that, that we do have to continue, while we're probing that we need to continue with sanctions and deterrence and counter proliferation efforts, but these measures are not enough. With these measures in place, the US must also focus on public diplomacy and ways to weaken the regime's grip and transform the relationship, the regime's relationship with its people, as we've been talking about thus far. It's about empowering the North Korean people. So I think that's my third point, Jiyun and uh, you know, Jiyun and other NGOs and uh, activists and other organizations have done a lot of work on this. News from information, outside information is already getting into North Korea, right? It's been happening for a number of years across the border, uh, porous border with China. Um, markets, black, gray markets, private markets um, made it easier uh, to distribute uh, technologies and media. And then more than ever, North Koreans are seeing the gap between the myths that the regime created and the reality. Um, but public diplomacy campaign also means, as Greg 
articulated so eloquently uh, the, for the Biden administration to maintain a global focus on, on North Korea's appalling record of abusing its own population. Um, regime has devoted scarce resources, building nuclear weapons, policing missile program, rather than feeding its own people. And we do need to highlight this link uh, and push for renewed human rights investigations resolutions. So ultimately, I'll just wrap up with this. So the strategy, the public diplomacy, combining information and human rights campaign, um, that is the only long-term solution for North Korea. Um, information and human rights campaign will not I agree. I, I don't think it will likely yield any quick results on the nuclear front. Let's be very practical about this, um, realistic about this. But as we point out in our report, it might plant the seeds, right, for a more, more uh, enduring shift. And, and public diplomacy, as you mentioned in the beginning of today, uh, it, it pressures the regime where it, where it is most vulnerable, right, uh, which is, I believe, uh, in undoubtedly internal pressure. That's where they're most vulnerable. So the bottom line is, as we make it clear in the report, only when North Korea becomes more accountable and responsive to its own people, will there be any chance for meaningful progress towards nuclearization. So ultimately, North Korea's nuclear crisis, nuclear threat, human rights abuses, these are reflections of North Korean government. North Korean regime. So until that regime either dramatically reforms itself or collapses on its own, uh, the nuclear threat and human rights violations were continued. Thank you, Sue. You mentioned one of the many points you've made uh, was the important effect that access to uh, foreign in content has, which is relative deprivation and um, showing kind of the, the relative grievances that people may have. And this is something that has been analyzed very extensively uh, with information campaigns throughout and, and public diplomacy efforts throughout the Cold War, uh, including uh, in Romania during the Cold War. So thank you very much for your remar remarks, Sue. Uh, Dave, I want to turn to you now. Uh, Dave Maxwell, you have served for 30 years in the U.S. Army, and you've retired as a Special Forces Colonel, and you've had incredibly rich experiences on the Korean Peninsula and beyond during and after um, your military service. And so from your perspective, why do you think it is so critical to engage in a policy of public diplomacy? And why and how would this be in uh, the direct interest of the United States? Over to you, uh, over to you Dave. Uh, thank you, uh, Jian. It was uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, this incredible effort that you have put together and led, and uh, so I thank you for that. Now, although I'm going to make uh, remarks uh, from a military perspective, uh, let me state up front that we focus on human rights and information because it's the right thing to do, and not simply because they will support military operations uh, or the interests of the United States or the Republic of Korea. We do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and I think we should keep that in mind. Now, first, let me say that uh, the motto of U.S. Special Forces is De Oppresso Liber, uh, which is roughly translated to free the oppressed. Uh, but the more subtle way to express this is to help the oppressed free themselves. Uh, and this is really what responsible members of the international community must do um, to help the Korean people in the North really to free themselves. Now, the means to help in the people in the North is through a human rights upfront approach. And I associate myself with all the comments that have been made uh, and uh, uh, proud to associate myself with all the previous comments uh, from everyone. And, um, uh, but, uh, you know, in, in addition to human rights upfront approach, it also includes access to information. And this human rights focus is not only a moral imperative, it is a national security issue because as discussed, Kim Jong-un must deny the human rights of the Korean people in the North in order to survive and remain in power. Uh, Dr. Jung Pak, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia Pacific and the Deputy um, to Ambassador Sung Kim for, um, uh, for uh, the Special Advisor for North Korean negotiations, you know, she often asks, who does Kim Jong-un fear more, the United States or the Korean people living in the North? Uh, and I would argue it's the people armed with information and more specifically information about life in the South, as Greg has uh, articulated. You know, but one of the many terrible human rights abuses is the lack of access to in outside information. Uh, the people in the North have a right to access the truth about the world, about their plight, and about their rights. 
Now, how will these policy recommendations uh, translate to help the combined ROC US uh, uh, military command uh, across the spectrum of armistice, contingency, and, and conflict? Now, during armistice, which we're currently, currently in, all information instruments, uh, governmental, non-governmental organizations, private groups and citizens, uh, and the military uh, must be effectively employed to get messages to the Korean people. Um, I think Professor Allison mentioned that uh, uh, you know there's a, we create a moral hazard by sending information uh, into the North uh, and putting the people at risk if they receive that foreign and read that foreign information or listen to DVDs. Uh, but during North Korean Freedom Week, uh, I was on a panel and I asked some escapees, uh, Kim Hyung Soo and uh, and Chu Kyo, uh, Kyun Bae, uh, if if that was the case, and they said that. The people in North Korea know the risks, but they still are willing to accept those risks to have access to information. I think we should keep that in mind, uh, that they want it, they thirst for it. Uh, and so we should, we should, really, uh, we should really support that. Um, the, uh, the people must be informed of their situation as uh, Dr. Terry has talked about and, and, uh, and Greg. Um, but, uh, but most importantly, they need to know that the outside world cares about their welfare uh, and that there is hope for a better future. Um, and this will form the foundation for actions and activities that will take place during contingencies, uh, during instability and regime collapse, uh, and in the worst case, uh, war and its aftermath, which we hope uh, never, never happens uh, and which we must continue to work to deter. Uh, but how the people respond and act in any scenario will influence the outcome. And the more information and knowledge that they have, the better they are gonna be able to make decisions uh, under duress when they're faced with, with crisis, personal crisis uh, and, uh, and the difficulties uh, all of these scenarios uh, will bring to them. Uh, and of course, it will increase their ability to survive and contribute to reducing instability and bringing any conflict uh, to a swift conclusion. Now, without information, the Korean people fear anything and anyone uh, outside of North Korea. And of course, this is due to their uh, indoctrination. And many will, could likely resist any outsider uh, to include their brothers and sisters in the South. You know, this is why it's imperative uh, to inform them about the outside world and what the intentions of those who might enter North Korea uh, to help them in any scenario are. Now, regardless of what happens on the Korean Peninsula, uh, there are going to be myriad military requirements in support of human rights, uh, from humanitarian relief uh, to securing the gulags, to providing information, support, uh, and security for a transitional justice process. But most importantly, all operations will have a greater chance of success if the U.S., the Republic of Korea, and the international community execute their responsibilities to provide information to the Korean people living into the north, uh, provide information to the Korean people living in the north. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, they need us to do that. Uh, and again, we need to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Over to you, Dr. Beck. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. So now I'll quickly transition to the Q&A. We've received a lot of questions. And so I'll open it up. And this is directed to anyone really on the panel. Um, do you think that a peace treaty declaration of an end of Korean war and diplomatic engagement with North Korea can change the Kim regime to promote denuclearization and human rights improvements. So perhaps instead of a, dip, a public diplomacy policy, how about, you know, what about a peace treaty declaration of the end of the Korean war and engaging the regime? Uh, Dave, let's start with you. Yes, uh, you know, I think uh, Kim Jong-un wants a, a, peace, uh, a peace treaty or a peace regime uh, because it supports his political warfare strategy. Um, you know, he wants us to end this hostile, end the hostile policy, which he defines as uh, the ROC US alliance, US forces on the Korean Peninsula, uh, and the nuclear umbrella and extended deterrence over the ROC in Japan. Uh, and I think that uh, he likely believes that a, a peace treaty or a peace regime uh, would do that, or an end of war declaration uh, would likely do that. Um, to me, I mean, while I support a peace treaty, I support peace on the, on the, the Korean Peninsula, if it does not include uh, North Korean conventional uh, withdrawal from the DMZ and a reduction of the threat, uh, 
the security of South Korea will not be enhanced by uh, any kind of end of war declaration or peace treaty. And I think that needs to be uh, the first and foremost consideration. Uh, so if negotiations to end the war can lead to a reduction in the threat from North Korea, um, you know, I would support that. But I also think uh, that uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, his real intention would be to exploit such an end of war declaration uh, to drive a wedge in the rock US alliance and really try to force uh, US forces off the Korean Peninsula. And I would add the importance of US forces on the Korean Peninsula uh, really um, were emphasized by Wang jung yap when he defected in 1997. And he said that, uh, you know, after all the, these decades, North Korea never attacked the South for one reason, and that's the presence of US forces. Uh, and so I think we should keep that in mind. If we want to prevent war in the peninsula, uh, we must have a strong deterrence policy. And that means the presence of US forces in a combined command. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. The North Korean president goes way beyond North Korea. This is a regime that commits crimes against humanity, against its own people and citizens of other countries, according to a February 2014 UN Commission of Inquiry report. This is a regime that joined the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, then pulled out of the NPT and developed a clandestine nuclear weapons program. If we blindly enter a peace treaty with North Korea in the absence of improvement on the human rights front, or in the absence of denuclearization, which we want to be, well, full, final, verifiable, complete, verifiable, irreversible, this will set the precedent for other rogue regimes committing crimes against humanity, against their own people. They will learn that the United States, the United Nations, the international community will lose their patience. All you need to do is develop weapons of mass destruction, a nuclear weapons program, and then they will play. So again, we are all, and I am personally in favor of peace, reconciliation, reunification under a free, democratic, prosperous Republic of Korea. Uh, this option has to be considered very carefully. Thank you, Greg. Sue? Yes, so I want to say, you know, I understand in theory why people ask this, right? Because the Korean War ended with a ceasefire and armistice in 1953, it has never been replaced by a former peace treaty. Um, it was supposed to be a peace agreement, a temporary agreement, the armistice is still in place. And there are many scholars and experts who, who I mean, there are people who argue that North Korea uh, is genuinely seeking a peace treaty because they want to genuinely mend relationship with Washington and so on. But um, I do think prematurely concluding this is very problematic. Um, and also for all the reasons that they, Greg and um, they just talked about, but the problem also, I would say with continuing, a, uh, concluding a peace treaty and normalizing relations without achieving denuclearization, which I, without um, even improving on human rights and anything else that we agree on is how can we also be sure the North Korean regime would abide by any deal that we sign, right? How do we verify that North Korea will actually do what it says, even if it's a sort of part of an agreement, even if they are promised to abandon nuclear weapons, let's say in return for US troops pull out uh, for a peace treaty. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we have a long history of dealing with North Korea, which is littered with string of broken promises and problems with verification, right? Um, so, and I would just say last point that North Korea's sincerity in pursuing a peace treaty, I, I also think we need to doubt its sincerity because I do think real peace with Washington will be very problematic for Pyongyang because how could North Korea justify its existence if normalization with the US occurs and it has to abandon this very confrontational anti-American stance that it constitutes one of the last remaining uh, sources of legitimacy for um, North Korea. So I, I do think that sincerity has to be doubted. And the real reason North Korea is seeking a peace treaty is probably because it, it believes that it, the, such a treaty would cause all sides, including South Koreans and Americans, to question the need for continuation of alliance and US military presence in South Korea. Thank you, Sue. Uh, next question, someone asks, it seems like part of achieving the suggestions in this report may require the US to lift the travel ban on Americans going to North Korea. What do the panelists think about 
uh, the travel ban being lifted for Americans. Greg, do you want to take that? Uh, yes, sure, I will take that. Uh, well, multiple Americans have been uh, arrested, imprisoned uh, in North Korea um, under charges uh, pertaining to behavior that is perfectly normal in any half normal country, such as, for example, bringing a religious book into the country or leaving a religious book behind, whether intentionally or not. We all remember the very tragic uh, death of Otto Warmby, a young, bright uh, American MBA student uh, who was uh, arrested, uh, tried, uh, detained on, on charges that would barely amount to a, a fraternity prank here in the United States. So this is a highly dangerous environment for Americans traveling to North Korea, for citizens of other countries traveling to North Korea. So uh, the, the lifting of this ban would have to be contingent on the North Korean regime's explanation, apology for uh, the, the death of, of Otto Warmbier at first and foremost, because Otto is not forgotten. We still remember him. We still remember what happened to him. Moreover, I have to say that under the pretext of COVID, basically uh, the Kim regime has expelled almost all foreign nationals from the country. Uh, they, they have used and abused COVID as uh, a, a political propaganda tool. The UN had two uh, international workers left in the country. They're gone. They, they were sent out a few months ago. There are barely any, if any, NGO international workers left in country. Most embassies have withdrawn their, their personnel from North Korea. The Poles and the handful of others still had a few foreign personnel there until a few months ago. I'm not sure what the status is right now. So uh, this is an environment that's very hostile to uh, international experts working inside North Korea. This is an environment that's very hostile to international technical assistance. The regime uh, does not accept internationally uh, applicable standards of uh, project monitoring and evaluation. It, it's a very difficult environment. And the resumption of travel to North Korea and the lifting of bans would have to take into account uh, a variety of issues, including the safety of nationals of the United States and other countries. And of course, the, the UN sanctions uh, applicable to North Korea, the UN Security Council sanctions, US, EU, uh, Japanese, and other sanctions that are applicable. So uh, that would have to be considered, again, very, very carefully. Thank you, Greg. The next question I'll turn to Marcus and then Dave. The question is, the South Korean government currently seems to put a priority on not upsetting the North Korean regime. They recently passed the information gag law nicknamed the anti-leaflet law. So how, could, how does not provoking the regime help South Korea's uh, pursuits to uh, pursue denuclearization? Why is the South Korean government, the South Korean government, blocking sending information into North Korea? Marcus? You're on mute. Unfortunately, this is a result of uh, effective tactics of coercion by North Korea. So um, for, for those of you who uh, don't know the whole story, I think many of our audience may not be familiar with what transpired last summer, uh, is North Korea generated an artificial crisis um, focusing on the, uh, the issue of balloons carrying information in North Korea, but more broadly accusing South Korea of, uh, of having a hostile policy alongside the U.S. toward North Korea and, and uh, abetting and, and aiding these non-government organizations into getting anti-regime information uh, into North Korea. And so um, this didn't get a whole lot of play um, in the United States and the Western press other than for people who were really focused on it. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other things going on in the, in the world and in the United States at the time. Um, but uh, it, it got to the point where, uh, where so uh, North Korea actually blew up uh, the liaison office um, that they had been, uh, they, they had inside North Korean uh, territory where they had uh, South Koreans 
um, it, uh, operating out of this liaison office. So first they, they kicked out the, uh, the South Koreans, basically forced them um, in a situation where they had to leave. And then once that was done, uh, then they they very visibly blew up this office and and not just uh, you know a uh, you know a, a calm simple sort of matter of fact thing but a, a very dramatic uh, televised uh, destruction explosions and everything uh, basically it, it was a piece of South Korean property that they could destroy um, and and South Korean uh, equipment um, that they could uh, that they could uh, wreck without actually you know, provoking uh, a uh, a counterattack uh, from South Korea right so it was the perfect. Uh, Sort of uh, a lever of coercion is that they could show um, their uh, their their seriousness of their threat. Um, they could leverage uh, this fear, um, and at the same time, they could also uh, basically make the case: Hey, you want dialogue? Well, we're not going to have dialogue as long as you allow this to happen. Uh, the, this uh, information getting into uh, North Korea that's against the regime, uh, and so uh, I think that's what caused. Um, this law to be passed. Uh, it's hard to make a case otherwise. Now you can you can put a, a positive face on it uh, if you're looking at it from the the perspective of of those in, in South Korea who who advocated for it is that we're trying to promote a more positive relationship with North Korea. But at the end of the day, it was bowing to coercion from North Korea, uh, and uh, and 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 that's the the tactic that they they chose was to try and appease North Korea um, in 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 that particular case just to get them. Um, to the point where they'd be willing to reopen communications. And then even though they passed the law, the North Koreans only over a year later, finally just recently reopened the communication line. Um, and there was this uh, real excitement in, 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 in Seoul and, uh, and, and elsewhere. I was at some events uh, you know, recently where this was discussed as a really positive development. But at the, uh, at the end of the day, um, the communication line didn't stay open for very, very long. The North Koreans have closed it down again um, because uh, they claim that uh, the, the very, very uh, limited defensive military exercises that the U.S.-South Korea alliance is conducting um, are, uh, are, are a threat and are, are hostile, et cetera. So, so essentially, North Korea was rewarded for this coercive behavior um, and, uh, and, and particularly uh, focused on the information space as a, as a way to, uh, to push back against uh, South Korea and to help protect um, its, uh, its regime uh, interests. Um, so I think this shows under the Kim Jong-un regime that we're dealing with right now um, that bowing to North Korean coercion just begets more coercion. Uh, and it's particularly problematic in that for, for really essentially nothing, um, not, not a trade, but just uh, a, a unilateral concession, South Korea bowed to North Korean wishes um, in a way that really was of concern, obviously, to the regime. They wouldn't have made a big deal about it if they weren't if they didn't feel the pressure, if they weren't concerned about it. Um, and, but at the end of the day, South Korea unilaterally uh, made this concession and North Korea just uh, over the course of the last 14 months took advantage uh, of that, uh, that, that uh, willingness to bow to coercion and is now again embarking on a coercive campaign. Kim Yong-chol and, uh, and Kim Yo-jong, basically Kim, Kim Jong-un's military mentor and Kim Jong-un's sister have, have both, uh, uh, issued very inflammatory remarks and, and threatening statements uh, very recently, just as they did uh, uh, back early last summer um, before the destruction of the uh, of the liaison office and, and around that whole situation of coercion. So, so essentially, uh, th this this bowing to coercion again, particularly on information issues, just really rewards the regime's uh, bad behavior and restricts our ability to pressure uh, the regime. Dave. Well, Marcus did a great job of, uh, of doing that. I just add that you know part of the rationale that uh, the Koreans have used is uh, to defend the Korean people uh, in the frontline areas where the balloon launches come from, uh, which of course nobody's ever been hurt or injured or killed uh, by a North Korean response to any of the launches. Uh, but uh, but I agree with with Marcus wholeheartedly. Uh, when when North Korea sees these actions, they assess that their political warfare strategy is a success. And it causes them to double down on their blackmail diplomacy, uh, which is simply to use threats, increase tensions and provocations to gain political and economic concessions. Uh, but the anti-leaflet law and the, the restrictions on information, I think really rests on, on a fundamental uh, flawed assumption by South Korea that uh, being nice to North Korea uh, will bring about a positive change. And I think that the president wants peace at any cost. Uh, that's you know, his legacy. Uh, and I think that uh, 
uh, they are under the misguided belief uh, that uh, that making concessions uh, and appeasing the regime uh, will bring about a positive change. And for years, the regime has showed us that's not the case. Thank you, Dave. And on to the next question. We have so many good questions coming in. Next question. Sanctions have had very little effect on changing North Korean regime's behavior. Some have argued that the real victims of the sanctions are the vulnerable North Korean people. Should, should sanctions be eased, especially in uh, considering the human rights situation in North Korea? Uh, Dave, do you wanna take this? First, we should remember that UN sanctions and US law uh, do not prohibit the provision of humanitarian assistance, food aid, and medical aid. Uh, so th they don't prohibit that. Uh, you know, second is Kim Jong-un has to want to accept it. Uh, and he's rebuffed, uh, you know, efforts uh, and, and um, offers from South Korea and from the United States. Uh, third is that sanctions are not the cause of the suffering of the Korean people living in the North. It is Kim Jong-un's deliberate policy decisions to prioritize nuclear weapons and missile development and support to the military and the elite over the welfare of the Korean people living in the North. And of course, they're suffering now because of, uh, as Marcus talked about, uh, the implementation of COVID restrictions, uh, crackdown on the markets, on information, on movement, uh, the closure of the borders. Uh, those are all decisions made by Kim Jong-un. They are not the result of sanctions. Uh, but most importantly, for all those who, who uh, advocate for sanctions uh, to be lifted, uh, first, let me say that sanctions are not to change North Korean behavior necessarily. Sanctions are due to the malign behavior and activities of the Kim family regime. And so if you advocate lifting of sanctions, ask yourself which malign behavior you would like to condone. Continued nuclear and missile development, continued proliferation of weapons around the world, continued global illicit activities, counterfeiting drug trafficking uh, around the world, uh, continued cyber attacks around the world, uh, and continued human rights abuses and crimes against humanity. Because to lift sanctions uh, without the corresponding change by the North Korean regime means that we have to condone those behaviors. Uh, and the international community, the UN Security Council, the US Congress has implemented sanctions and laws uh, because of this terrible uh, behavior by the regime uh, that cannot go unaccounted for. Uh, so uh, I don't think we're going to see sanctions lifted anytime soon, and they should not be used as a bargaining chip uh, regardless. Thank you. Marcus? Uh, unsurprisingly, I, I agree very much with Dave, but I think there are a couple uh, other points I would like to add. As I, I do think um, there is unintentional uh, damage being done to uh, to some uh, North Koreans that are not intended targets uh, of of sanctions, um, but uh, I think that the the efforts can be made to uh, to adjust how sanctions are implemented and, and how how they're enforced, uh, how the exceptions are done to minimize uh, those effects. But that really is is uh, is not uh, a a possibility right now um, to to really have an effect because of the measures that the North Korean regime is taking uh, in, in its claim to how it's responding to, to COVID. Uh, and so that is having a much, much greater effect on the North Korean people and on their access um, to uh, resources and their economic livelihoods than any uh, sanctions action uh, being, being taken right now. So uh, once North Korea, if North Korea starts to uh, reopen in a major way sometime uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, having changed its policies or, or being more confident it's containing COVID, um, then uh, a robust effort to look at sanctions exceptions and how sanctions are implemented to minimize the effects on the North Korean people and on NGOs that are trying to help the North Korean people legitimately. Um, I, I think that's very realistic. Um, I mean, it's not a black or white issue. I mean, there is some, I think, unintentional problems that, that were caused even before the COVID uh, effects went into place. Uh, but but at the end of the day, Dave is right. The vast majority of the um, of the harm, economic uh, economic harm done to the North Korean people and to their to their livelihoods, to their health, is not at all because of sanctions. When you really look at it, it goes back to a period long before uh, sanctions were in place of any significance. When the North Korean economy was destroyed by these terrible policies um, that the uh, North Korean regime 
uh, imposed on its people uh, and and uh, and tried to maintain, despite all evidence to the contrary, these policies were just going to lead to uh, further uh, further hardships uh, for for its people. And so I, I think um, that 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 sanctions are an element, but again, they can be. I think uh, managed and implemented in a way that minimizes the effects on the North Korean people and on the, the non-government organizations, uh, and even uh, you know, in some cases, third governments that might wanna try and help those people. I think there are, there are ways to do that. And again, after, after the COVID restrictions in North Korea are dialed back, I think that should be a focus to, in order to maintain the, the sanctions that we do need to keep the North Korean uh, nuclear programs in check, nuclear missile programs in check. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, just on the effectiveness of sanctions piece, I just want to say sanctions also take time. Um, and it's, I think, worth noting that um, in by late 2017, we actually saw things working, right? We had a 90% of North Korean exports were illegal under international law. Um, on top of US sanctions, there was nine major Security Council resolutions that banned North Korea's most lucrative exports, right? coal, iron, seafood, textiles, among others. Um, that were netting the regime $3 billion a year. Um, but you need the sanctions to be enforced um, for it to work. And actually in fall of 2017, I just wanna make this point that China to everybody's surprise was finally doing its part after years of dragging its feet. Um, we also had 20 countries, over 20 countries uh, that had restricted North Korea's foreign diplomatic presence and they were really isolating the regime. My point is, but then we very quickly, it takes time, right? Recall that for Iran, it ag Iran agreed to roll back and not eliminate, but roll back its nuclear program in 2015 after three years of maximum pressure. Um, and North Korea, I'm not saying that they, this would have led North Korea to give up nuclear weapons, um, but you would have had a greater incentive to negotiate in a better faith than move away, you know, instead of making these maximalist demands that they made in Hanoi. Um, but I so I do think the Trump administration too prematurely pivoted to maximum engagement from maximum pressure. So the air really started to leak out of the sanctions campaign. So now we have China, Russia not really implementing sanctions as robustly, they're, they're just not. Um, and so it, I just wanted to make that point and uh, about blaming the United States for you know, the sanctions. I, I just wanna remind people, you know, this is a regime that Kim Jong-il spent, was it hundreds of millions of dollars building a mausoleum for Kim Il-sung while people were eating tree barks uh, during the famine years. Thank you, Sue. On that note, um, I'd like to turn to the panelists for any final remarks, anything you wanna say that you didn't cover? Well, uh, one final thought. Um, if there's one thing that the outside world can do to bring positive change and transformation to North Korea, that is to empower the people of North Korea. Change can only come from the people of North Korea themselves. And the one thing that we can do is to empower them through information from the outside world as proposed, as put forth by this effort that you have led to. So again, a great pleasure, great honor uh, to have been on this team. Uh, and uh, I really think that this is a, a project for the future. This is truly a very important piece of the puzzle that will uh, forge a, a strategy moving forward, a strategy that will bring us to what Dave loves referring to as the new rock, the United Republic of Korea. Do you want know, to say two lines? Um, basically that I agree, I mean, I agree with what Greg just said, but um, very importantly, informi information needs to get into North Korea as well as your point, Jiyun, and this report we, we make this point in this report that it also needs to travel safely within North Korea, between people in North Korea, right? To create that internal source of pressure. So that's the final analysis that in the final analysis, the only way uh, that the threat from North Korea will truly come to an end um, is that the current regime must be transformed and there must be a transform, in, transform environment inside North Korea. Thank you, David. I'll just repeat, uh, we have to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, I'll say again, Deo Presso Liber, uh, let's help the Korean people uh, free themselves. Great, uh, great work, uh, Dr. Beck. And uh, this, I commend everybody to read this report uh, because it is important.
Marcus? So I want to close with talking a little bit about the environment that we see for information in North Korea. We, we didn't talk much about that, and I saw some skepticism in the comments about the potential effectiveness of, of all of this. And I think uh, it's important for our audience to know, the people reading the report to know, that there, there are opportunities now presented by social change in North Korea uh, that resulted from the, the collapse of the North Korean economy in the 1990s um, and this uh, adoption of a trade or die sort of mentality. Um, that uh, that opened a window now, an opportunity for uh, some cracks in, in terms of the flow of information in the regime's control that, that didn't exist uh, prior to that time. Uh, technology at the same time also provides uh, opportunities um, to get information to the to North Korean people and allow information to flow in North Korea uh, in ways that did not exist before. But this is an arms race between the people trying to get information into North Korea and, and the regime's efforts to, uh, to use technology, to use monitoring, uh, to, to use coercion to block the information uh, getting in. Uh, and so the opportunity is there, but it's not going to happen on its own. It has to be pursued vigorously uh, to make this possible. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Kim? Okay, um, so I will just close out. Actually, there's so many questions about the ins and outs of information access. Um, and so just quickly, for those, since we're running it, we have ran out of time. For those who are interested, Google the reports written by uh, Skip Vincenzo, who is actually one of the, the working group members of this report as well. Uh, reports written by Nat Kretchen, K-R-E-T-C-H-U-N, Martin Williams. Uh, this report, as well as my book, actually cites a lot of other references um, of surveys and reports and testimonies and other books on the topics of the very detailed ins and outs of how foreign content is getting in, getting um, North Korean information is getting out, and how information is traveling from within. And so, um, just on a closing note, thank you, everyone. You know, today we have heard from really some of the most renowned North Korea watchers and experts uh, with extensive careers in the US intelligence community, the military, and a prominent research-based NGO on human rights in North Korea. And our speakers today, as well as the working group members who are not on the panel today, all agree on one thing, which is public diplomacy with North Korea is the most practical, cost-effective, and long-term solutions-oriented policy that could help achieve the U.S.'s long-term policy and, um, and long-term objectives in North Korea. So I want to thank the Belfer Center today for sponsoring today's event. Thank you to all the speakers today, and a special thank you to the working group members who are not on today's panel. And thank you to everyone who's joined us really from all over the world at this hour. And on a final note, it is our working group's hope that the recommendations in this report will foster debate and most, uh, and more importantly, garner the support of our Biden administration as they continue to shape their overall policy with North Korea. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.